Hello everyone, it's so good to be with you today, coming here from our Delray Beach campus. I'm Pastor Ben Kurth, privileged to serve as the lead pastor of the English group at our Divine Savior Church Doral campus. So a blessing and a privilege for me to share God's word with you all today, whenever and wherever you might be when you're watching. This week, I received a phone call from someone whose wedding I officiated a number of years ago now. He gave me an update on life and told me how things were, were going for him. He shared some recent news from work that made him believe that he was soon going to be out of a job. He described uh, a memo he got at work as seeing the writing on the wall. He wondered, what does this mean? What should I do now? And so I, w I was honored that he thought to call me. And uh, we spent a little bit of time talking about some principles from God's word that God would have us apply really in our lives anytime that we're looking at making important life decisions. So we talked about, for example, a verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. In, in other words, ask yourself, is what I'm planning to do going to give glory to God? And we talked about some words of Jesus from John chapter 15 where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing apart from me. So he said, well, is what you're thinking of doing, is, is that, do you think, going to help you stay connected to Jesus and growing in Jesus? Or is that likely to tear you away from Jesus? Well, today in our Bible lesson from Daniel chapter 5, we're going to meet someone who did not take that kind of advice and put it into practice in his life. And as you might expect, we're going to see how that did not end very well when he saw the writing on the wall. The man's name was Belshazzar. Who was he? He, he? He's the king of Babylon at this time, probably the, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember him? We've been talking about him the last couple weeks. Uh, the, the mighty warlord, the great builder of Babylon, who about 50 years earlier had, had taken his army to Jerusalem and, and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple of the Lord, and, and carried off into captivity in exile young Daniel and his friends. In our message last week, we, we saw how God had to humble, God had to bring Nebuchadnezzar down until finally he would acknowledge God, the one true God, as his own. If only his grandson Belshazzar had listened to the public proclamations that Nebuchadnezzar made about the one true God, he, he might have learned his lesson the easy way. He, he might have reshaped his priorities in life in, in a God-honoring direction, in a God-honoring way. But instead, we're going to see today how Belshazzar had to learn his lesson the hard way, the really hard hard way. Our Bible story today begins at a drinking party. <laughs> no social distancing going on here. This was, you get the sense, an essential activity for Belshazzar and his nobles together with his wives and the, the girls of his harem. They're all there. 
this is a, a time for, for the king to, to, to party. It's a time for him to pour glasses of wine. It's flowing abundantly in the golden goblet, the sacred vessels that had been stolen from the, the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem many decades earlier when Nebuchadnezzar took that all back to Babylon. And now this was the stemware for their drinking party. The king, he's leading the way. He's setting the tone here at this large group gathering. Instead of, instead of eating and, and drinking in moderation to the glory of God, while thanking and, and praying and proclaiming the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God, Belshazzar takes the opportunity to raise his glass in a toast, insulting the one true God. He says, to the gods of gold and silver, as if to say to everybody, look at all of my wealth here. And to the gods of bronze and iron, as if to say, look at our military might. And to the gods of wood and stone, as if to say, look around at these grand buildings, look at all of our accomplishments. We read in Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, that was a term that means you know, ancestor, so it's probably his, his grandfather here, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Well, it seems pretty clear, doesn't it, what Belshazzar's priorities were in his life. Despite the presence of, of a foreign army of the Medes and Persians literally lying in wait outside the, the gates of Babylon, Belshazzar maintains this cocky, defiant posture. It's almost as if he, he thinks, or at least wants other people to think, that nothing bad can touch him. You get the sense that he felt nothing could harm him. And maybe we see here a little glimpse of the same kind of attitude in some people today who by their words and actions almost you know, mock other people as if nothing bad could ever happen to them. But perhaps there's a little bit of Belshazzar in me too. And maybe you. It, it can happen when in, instead of asking the question, is, is this going to give glory to God? We find ourselves thinking, I just want to go out and have a good time. Or instead of asking the question, is, is this a way for me to live my life, to show the love of Jesus to other people? But instead we find ourselves thinking, I just want to live my life the way I want to live my life. Belshazzar was having a good time, drinking a lot of good wine with his friends, almost completely oblivious to the fact that his own doom and destruction was right around the corner. And that's when it happened. Verse 5 says, Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and, and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Wow. Can, can you imagine this? Like, like a hush comes over the crowd. People start to gasp. Can you imagine 
in the flickering candlelight on, on a well-lit wall, seeing this mysterious writing of a disembodied hand? Can you imagine seeing your proud, strong king, his knees shaking and, and the color draining away from his face until he looks white as a ghost? Like, could you imagine a, a scene on national TV, one of the president's press brie briefings, perhaps, and, and all of a sudden you, you, you see his, his knees start to shake and the color drain away from his face, full of fear. Or imagine any, any other world leader, perhaps, who tries to project toughness and strength and the appearance, at least, that I've got everything under my control. Maybe we shouldn't be too quick to ever wish to see such a thing. Let me ask you, friends, when's the last time that your knees knocked when you heard the preaching of God's word that exposed your Christian hypocrisy or the secret sins of your heart that you've tried so well to keep under wraps? When's the last time that, that the fear of God caused the color to drain away from your face because you were faced with the shame of what you'd said or done? When's the last time when it really just hit you that the wages of my sin is going to be death? God has a way of sobering us up to see things for how they really are. There's a Bible verse in Galatians that says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God cannot be mocked. But that's exactly what Belshazzar was doing, right? He was mocking God. And, and that's really what anybody does who, who by their words or actions indicates that they think that they can somehow escape the, the righteous judgment of God. Friends, who, who are you going to call when the writing's on the wall? When that day comes, perhaps sooner than you'd ever like to think, and you are all of a sudden confronted with the fact that you're going to die. Or when you receive news of that which you've always dreaded to hear, or that day that you hope would never come has now arrived. Who are you going to call when the writing's on the wall of your life? Well, Belshazzar, he, he called for the occult practitioners of Babylon and tried to offer them a bribe, right? As if he wanted them to just tell them what he wanted to hear to feel better about things or to see if there was anything that they could do to, to somehow appease the anger of, of any offended gods out there. And if you think about it, that's not all that different from... A person who thinks, well, maybe there's just some religious good-looking thing that I can do to kind of just, you know, act like everything's going to be okay. Or, or maybe if I can just, you know, I'll go and find the answers that are going to make me feel good. You know, like a person who says, I'm just going to go ask Google whatever, you know, big questions that I have. And I'm going to go and I'm going to find whatever article tells me what I've confirmed I already believe and want to know. Verse 7 continues in our story. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he'll be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in. But they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. 
So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. Like, this isn't the tough king that we know, Mr. Untouchable. Verse 10, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, your ancestor, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. Hmm. Now, when we first met Daniel a couple of weeks ago, remember, he was a young man, right? A teenager, like perhaps a recent graduate of Divine Savior Academy in Jerusalem. And last week, we saw Daniel more like as a middle-aged man. Kind of like me who recently turned 40 with a few more gray hairs each and every day. But now we see Daniel, and he's an older man, perhaps around 80. And it seems as if Daniel and his wisdom had sort of been mothballed for a while. That Daniel's no longer serving in that inner circle of the king's advisors like he used to do during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Ah, but there is, there is someone who remembers Daniel's special wisdom. And that, that's the queen who's mentioned here. Who probably is Nebuchadnezzar's widow. Which would mean like Belshazzar's grandmother. Who comes to give him this advice that when the writing's on the wall... Who should you call, Belshazzar? Call Daniel. And so here's what we read next, verse 13. So Daniel was brought before the king. And the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you'll be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself, And give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. Those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms on earth and sets them over anyone he wishes. Now listen to this. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God 
who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Here's what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Well, let's just talk a little bit about those four words. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. What did they mean? Numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. And then that last word, parsin or peres, there's a little pun there, a little play on words. Because that word peres or parsin sounds a lot like Persia, doesn't it? Indicating that the Persian army that lay in wait outside the walls of Babylon ready to to pounce and carry out this prophecy against Belshazzar. The interpretation of Daniel, it was pretty clear too, right? God has judged Belshazzar and found him guilty. And so now his kingdom is coming to an end and it's going to be divided amongst the Medes and the Persians. That his kingdom is going to be torn away from him just like his own soul is about to be torn away from his body at the moment of of his death. So these were ominous, knee-knocking kind of words for Belshazzar, weren't they? And you heard what Daniel said to him. I want to repeat this this one verse. Daniel said to him, But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Friends, do you? Do you honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways? Or are you just kind of cruising through life thinking that you've got it made without having to think too much about God. Well, I think by now we we could say if we're all going to be really honest with each other, with ourselves, that there's no one here and there's no one watching anywhere in the world who can say that they've lived their life in a perfectly God-honoring way. I know that I can't. And we, we know from God's written word in the Bible that, that our days are numbered. We know from the message of God's law that, that we've been found wanting in the sight of God. We, we lack the, the perfect record of glorifying God in every aspect of our lives, which God is worthy of and which he requires of us. So what are we going to do? What, what are we going to do when we face the future? And we realize that sooner or later, the writing is going to be on the wall of our lives. Well, it would be good for us not to follow in the footsteps of Belshazzar, but more to take our cue from someone like the Apostle Paul at the end of his life. When instead of boasting about all of his accomplishments and all of his success and and all of the affirmation that other people had given him over the years. And instead of acting as if because of his religious-looking life that he was good with God and untouchable, here's what he said about himself. As he looks back upon the story of his life in Romans chapter 7, he says, What a wretched man I am. 
Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Well, that's not the most self-flattering kind of thing to say, is it? But it's the kind of thing, the one thing that a man like Belshazzar was never going to admit. His deep, abiding need for God and his grace. Fortunately for the Apostle Paul, as he helps us to think about this too, he he realizes that in being able to say, who am I? I am am a wretched man. I'm in need of a Savior. That when, when the writing was on the wall of his life, he knew that these words were also true for him. The next verse, he goes on to say, Thanks be to God who delivers me through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, friends, as indelible as the handwriting was on the wall for Belshazzar, announcing that the message of his doom and destruction, God still has indelible words of comfort for you and for me in the face of our own inevitable death one day, whenever that day might be. And I pray that that these words promised by God, might be writ large upon the billboard of your heart. Here are the words that Paul goes on to say in verse 1 of Romans chapter 8 when he says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you hear that? No doom, no judgment, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Why? Well, because like we heard earlier in the service from that Bible reading from the Gospel of John, because Jesus, when he saw that that the writing was on the wall, so to speak, in his own life, and he knew that soon he himself was going to die, he, he did not selfishly shrink away from that so as to save himself. But instead, he sought and prioritized the honor and glory of God, his Father, so that he could save us from our sins. And so he, the holy, sinless Son of God, he humbled himself. And he became obedient even to death, to death on a cross. And there in our place, he drank the full strength cup of God's wrath for our sins. And with his holy, precious blood, he put into full effect the new covenant of God's amazing grace. And the standing message of this covenant until the end of time, written for all the world to see in the holy precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is this, that all, all your sins have been forgiven. That we are at peace now with our God. That we lack nothing in his sight anymore. But we are no longer wanting before God because the perfect righteousness of Jesus has been credited to us by faith. And so who we really are now in the sight of God is not wretched, for we have been redeemed. And because of Jesus, one day we will be resurrected and glorified. So if you want four words today, written on the wall of your life? Wretched, redeemed, resurrected, glorified. Jesus humbled himself, and therefore, the Bible says, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow those proud knees standing untouchable before God and those knees that knock in fear. Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So friends, there may come a time in your life when fear strikes out of the blue 
a great reversal of what you thought the future was going to look like. And maybe even the sudden diagnosis or news of your own impending death. And yet everything now we know is going to be okay. Because when the writing is on the wall of your life, you know now who to call upon. Your Savior, Jesus Christ. The King of kings. Who loved you so much that he laid down his life for you and conquered death and lives for you so that even now he's preparing a place for you and for me in his eternal kingdom. And so take to heart the words of him who holds you now in his nail-scarred, glorified hands of love. When he says, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you will honor me. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Let's go to our God in prayer. Let me pray. Holy God, you hold in your hands all our lives. May we always respect your power and heed your saving words so that all we do would be to your glory. We are reminded today that just as Babylon came to a swift and abrupt end, so too will all this fading glory of the world Keep us, therefore, ever watchful for the coming return of our dear Savior Jesus and and eager for his kingdom. Until then, shape our priorities in light of his eternal rule and comfort us in every situation that the same hand that wrote on the wall has now also written our names in the book of life with an ink so indelible that all your promises to us now are yes in Jesus Christ. Amen.